This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. This is the Talking Animal Law podcast, brought to you every two weeks by the UK Centre for Animal Law and hosted by Paula Sparks, Director of A Law. But it's not just for lawyers, it's for anyone who cares about animals. So no matter who you are, if you want to know more about animal protection, news, ethics and animal law reform, then this is the podcast for you. Hello and welcome to this episode of Talking Animal Law. And in this truly international episode, this week I'm joined by Tamara Bedick, a lawyer in New York who will be joining me in discussion with international spokesperson and Eduardo Gonzalez and Professor David Bilchitz, a law professor in South Africa, talking about animal law and trophy hunting. Tamara Bedek is president of the New York City chapter of the National Lawyers Guild, in respect of which she is chair of the New York City Animal Rights Committee and a member of the Guild's Executive Committee. As a legal counsel, Tamara has successfully represented animal rescue groups pro bono, she is a donor and member of numerous animal groups, as well as a dog and cat rescuer. Eduardo Gonzalez has spent almost 30 years working and campaigning on the big issues in the US, UK, Europe and the Middle East, ranging from climate change, wildlife conservation, forests, the nuclear arms race, homelessness and animal cruelty, to name but a few. Recently, his focus has been on trophy hunting, and he's brought together leading politicians of all political persuasions in support of a ban on trophy hunting imports into the UK. The campaign is backed by national newspapers such as the Daily Mirror and The Times, and some of the country's best known public figures, conservation groups around the world and church and business leaders. Every single national political party included a ban on trophy hunting imports in the 2019 general election manifestos in the UK. A ban was announced in the 2019 Queen's speech and the government held a public consultation on ban proposals which finished in February 2020. Eduardo's most recent books, Trophy Hunters Exposed, Killing Game and Trophy Leaks, represent a series of important investigations into the trophy hunting industry and the toll it is inflicting on wildlife species. Professor David Bilchitz, last but not least, is a professor of law at the University of Reading and a professor of fundamental rights and constitution at the University of Johannesburg, and a director of the South African Institute for Advanced Constitutional, Public, Human Rights and International Law. He is Vice President of the International Association of Constitutional Law and a member of the Academy of Sciences of South Africa. He has held the positions of Visiting Research Professor at the Humboldt University in Berlin, a Visiting Professor at the National University of Singapore and a Visiting Research Professor at the Minerva Centre for Human Rights at the University of Tel Aviv. He has written extensively on a range of topics in the field of constitutional law and fundamental rights and has published four co-edited books, one textbook on jurisprudence, 20 book chapters and over 40 articles. Tamara, thank you very much for co-hosting the podcast with me today. It's the first time I've co-hosted one of these episodes and I'm really excited about it. Me too, Paula. Thank you very much for having me as a co-host today. No, 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 I'm really excited. And um, Eduardo and David, thank you both for your time. I can't think of anyone better to talk to about this important and very topical issue of trophy hunting and the bans. So thank you both very much indeed. Thank Great. you. It's great to be here. with you. Thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow, I'll, I'll hand over to you to kick off. Thank you, Paula. Um, well, my first question is for Eduardo. Eduardo, what do you mean by the term trophy hunting? Right. Well, the very first thing to say is got nothing to do with hunting for food. It's not subsistence hunting. Similarly, it's not culling or wildlife management. That is a specialized task uh, done by professionals. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and it certainly has nothing to do with self-defense or anything like that. This is purely the killing of an animal for so-called sport, so leisure, entertainment, fun, whatever you want to call it. And then to take a part of that animal or the whole animal and to display it, to take it home, display it in your living room or in a special trophy uh, room, 
in order to brag in effect it's it's uh, there's lots of reasons why um people do it or psychologists have looked into it a lot of it has got to do with costly signaling so kind of showing to your peers that you have the financial capacity the wealth and the power to be able to do this it's also the power of the animal that's the symbolism of it so it is to kill an animal um for leisure fun whatever and then to have a part of it to display at home in order to you know to, to to show off about it um and it's important to make a, a couple of additional points firstly um you know certainly it's been the uh, the, the the privilege or, or the privileged few that have done this are sort of elite over time but it, it really became something that took off on a on a large scale with colonialism so the the, the uh, arrival of the british in africa and then, you know, the army officers and the adventurers and so on that came with it, um, not just in Africa, actually, in Asia as well, in India, for example. Um, and then it sort of took over a, a, another leap, really, when uh, Americans started getting involved in the 20th century. But as I say, it's always been a very sort of elite, uh, privileged uh, activity. And it's very important to say this because it has absolutely nothing to do with the traditional culture in those places where it is largely practiced. So, for example, if you go to Africa, and you try to explain trophy hunting to people, they don't get it. They, they've never heard of it, and it's certainly not something that they would do. Their relationship with nature is very different. Generally, they have a much more reverent attitude towards wildlife and nature, and certainly the, the hunting of an animal, the killing of an animal, is something that is done as a necessity, and as a necessity only. It is certainly not done as a leisure activity, uh, for, for bragging rights. Um, and the same happens not just in Africa, but for example, in Inuit communities in, in Canada, for example, where polar bear trophy hunting takes place and where in fact the government has been working very hard in Canada to try to get uh, local communities involved. So as I say, it's very much a thing of the of a white, predominantly white elite, in places other than their own home, their own country, and it's done purely for sport and for boasting. That's really interesting, actually, some of those comments, and I think we'll return to them as we discuss the issues and the pros and cons that have been argued around this recently, because the UK has introduced a bill in Parliament which proposes, if it, if it passes to ban the import of hunting trophies, I think from species of conservation concern, but with additional powers to make regulations to amend the species within the scope of the pro prohibition. Eduardo, can you tell us a little bit more about this bill, how it came about, if you're happy with it, and what's the latest information about it? So it's got a bit of a history. It hasn't, it isn't something that's happened sort of just like that. Um, mm -hmm. in, in fact, it, um, uh, its origins really were around the Cecil story. So we all remember, or many people remember, 2015, that American dentist Walter Palmer shot this lion called Cecil. And there was international uproar about that. And in fact, things were already starting to happen in the international community just before and just after. So there were bans on lion trophy imports in places like France and Australia. The Netherlands then introduced a comprehensive ban. And in fact, the UK government at the time said it was also going to ban the import of lion trophies. It was Rory Stewart and then I think Liz Truss um, who both made this promise. And then I think it was probably promised elsewhere as well, but as time goes on and you have government reshuffles, ministerial reshuffles, um, then it, it was just one of those things that petered away. Um, and then in 2018, I think it was, I came across a, a news cutting or a report, I think it was on Agence France Press, so on a news wire, talking about how uh, trophy hunting was going to be brought back in Botswana. And I think I had the same sort of reaction that most people had when the whole Cecil story happened in 2015, which was, hang on a minute, trophy hunting? Is that really still a thing? Didn't that die out with the days of empire? And are people still shooting um, lions and, and elephants? And they're, in fact, they're shooting animals which we all know are in trouble. I mean, they're, they're not doing well. They're, 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 they've got all sorts of challenges. What on earth is going on? And I sort of you know, looked into it, and then I looked into... Um, you know, readily available data from CITES about, you know, the numbers and types of trophies that were coming into Britain, the species that are being shot by uh, British hunters and so on. Um, and I thought, goodness me. Uh, and so I, I think um, I talked to a number of members of Parliament and they actually tabled an early day motion. And an early day motion is kind of like a parliamentary petition. So it's it's 
MPs, they table it and they invite other MPs to sign it. And although it doesn't then go on to be debated, it's a way of demonstrating or testing, if you like, support or opinion on a given issue. And this particular early day motion, it turned out it was something like this, had the second most numbers of signatures of any early day motion that had been tabled in, in the UK Parliament, certainly in recent times. Um, and, uh, and in fact, they're already, I mean, this is before actually my, my organisation, the campaigns about trophy hunting were really uh, up and running, but they're already members of parliament who uh, were tabling and organising um, what they call Westminster Hall debates. So it's a, a parliamentary debate outside of the House of Commons, but still within, if you like, the parliamentary premises. And there were parliamentary questions being tabled, so um, and asked and asking for written answers and so on. So there was already... Um, if you like, a, a, a sentiment or, a, you know, there was already political motion happening on this. So anyway, that, the campaign to ban trophy hunting, you know, came along um, and we started looking into it more. We started doing investigations. I've got a bit of a background as a as a journalist and worked with people that I'd previously worked with on investigations on animal cruelty issues, uh, things like dog fighting and so on in a, pre in a previous life. And um, and and we started talking to MPs, and 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 things actually happened very quickly. So in fact, by 2019, the government actually announced in the Queen's speech, which is when they lay out the, the parliamentary plan, if you like, for the government, um, what their legislative uh, program is going to be. It said we're going to ban the import of hunting trophies of endangered species. And later that year, we had the general election, and both the ruling Conservative Party and the opposition Labour Party, they included this as a manifesto commitment, which is kind of like one of those copper bottom things. If it's in the manifesto, then you've got to do it. Um, and and things then carried on moving quite quickly. There was a, a public consultation process uh, that was hosted by DEFRA, the Environment Ministry, uh, which had, I mean, over 40,000 people took part and organisations took part. So it was extraordinary. And then there was a whole process of developing the legislation. And we're now at the point where, well, the bill is actually already going through Parliament. So it's had its initial stages of the first reading, which is just announcing the bill. The second reading, which is when the bill is actually published and debated in the House of Commons for the first time. Then you have the uh, committee stage. Uh, we had that very recently. So both the second reading and the committee stages, in fact, the, the bill went through unopposed. Uh, so clearly, once again, demonstrating that it's very strong cross-party support. We've been doing opinion polling on this question since about 2018, 2019. And what we found is that, I mean, regardless of how people voted in the last election or what class they're in, whereabouts they live, or how they voted even in the EU referendum, which has been one of the most divisive issues in British politics in, re in recent times, the poll numbers were the same and consistently so. And we've polled repeatedly. Other organisations have polled. I know uh, Humane Society have done polls. Born Free have done polls. The numbers are always the same. Somewhere between 80 to 90 percent of voters want this ban on hunting trophies being brought in. Um, and so we now have what's called the third reading stroke report stage happening at the same time coming up. Um, and again, it seems that there is very strong support for this. Um, and the government is saying that they're officially supporting it. It's actually their bill, although it's coming forward as a private member's bill, for reason of uh, uh, reasons of parliamentary time. Um, and now, uh, am I happy with the bill? I don't think there's a bill in the world that's perfect. But does this bill uh, go far enough? Well, let's put it this way. This path, this is going to be the strongest import ban implemented by any government anywhere in the world. Now, that's something I think we can all cheer. So um, absolutely, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with it. Of course, there's always going to be things I'll say, well, this could be a bit better, that could be better. But I do absolutely support this legislation um, and I absolutely call on others uh, to get behind it and indeed tell their MPs uh, that they're behind it as well. Well, that's really great. And in the same way you were talking about consensus building and the consensus between political parties, what I've noticed in your campaigning is you're working very collaboratively with other animal advocacy groups and indeed with our own uh, wildlife law team chair, Rob Epson, who we've had on this podcast before. Um, have you found that to be a helpful approach? Oh, absolutely. And I think, frankly, it's something that NGOs should be even better at. Uh, I mean, there's a tendency 
um, with uh, organisations in, in in the not-for-profit sector to sort of work a little bit in silos. Um, we have gone the exact other way on this issue, uh, and, and actually, it, it's it, you know it's worked very well. Um, because I think everyone feels very, very strongly about this, um, whether they're in organisations or indeed not. And, 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 and interestingly, we've reached out not just to other organisations, but we've also reached out to the media and uh, we, we reached out um, you know, to uh, public figures and so on. And, and, and I think where you build as broad a coalition as possible, that's where you actually start getting real traction and, and momentum because um you, you know mps and, and ministers government ministers take note of that if it's just you know one organization saying something well you can sort of brush them off if for example you get a whole bunch of organizations and they come together and you see for example on a letterhead if you're the government minister it's got all of those logos on it well you know a petition comes to number 10 downing street and 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 all these different organizations have been working on it. it's got over a million signatures on it um and if you've got then newspapers who are printing editorials saying absolutely we're behind this as well and they range as well across the spectrum because you know this is an issue which i know is supported by uh, for example the daily mirror on one side which uh, has an official campaign in support of us uh, the, the times on the other hand very very different newspaper different values different side of the end of the political spectrum they've written what four editorials in the last year and a half saying absolutely this bill needs to go ahead so coalition building certainly amongst ngos but i would say even further i think it, it, it is absolutely critical to success in in this day and age because at the end of the day ngos on their own we don't have a lot of resources mm. yeah we have a small number of our own supporters um we have a small pot of money to count on um, so we absolutely need to be better at pooling uh, our talents, our skills, our supporter bases um, and coming together uh, in a strategic way to achieve the big wins, which I think this this bill counts as. Thank you. I'm really I'm really glad that you say that and you've made those points. And just on a matter of law, um, sometimes I think it can be difficult to understand why we need a specific import ban when we already have CITES, which controls the trade in um, uh, species at risk of extinction. How does um, this fit with that regime and why CITES not already protecting animals at risk from this type of trade? Well, that's the thing about CITES. So it was set up very much to protect uh, threatened species, endangered species, hence the name of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. So to protect those animals from uh, being pushed to the brink of extinction and beyond by wildlife trade, of which trophy hunting clearly is a type of trade because trophy gets hunted here, gets shipped over there. But there's a loophole in the law. And so a trophy hunter can shoot an animal which CITES says should not be traded or where there are very strict regulations and restrictions. And of course, this has been exploited openly by illegal wildlife traffickers. Right. So for example, let's take the case of the rhino. The white rhino, one of the most endangered animals on earth, the white rhino has got about 10,000 animals left in the wild um, and very, very strict restrictions on wildlife trade and the trade in rhino horn, etc. However, if you're a trophy hunter or say that you're a trophy hunter, you can go and shoot that animal. You can get you have to get a permit, but that is a relatively routine uh, procedure. And of course, you have had wildlife traders who've exploited that. And they literally you had uh, Thai cr crime syndicates who are putting Vietnamese peasants and prostitutes on pla on planes, paying them a few hundred dollars, getting them to shoot a rhino, supposedly as a trophy hunter, pose for that photo that awful selfie that you always have to take you know when you're a trophy hunter um, and then sign yes i'm a trophy hunter and take that rhino horn home and of course it goes straight into the illegal wildlife trade and uh, and now and people often talk about the threats to uh trophy well two species like rhinos being poaching and of course poaching is a very serious threat there are many other threats as well but it's important to remember that in some years the number of rhinos that have been shot by trophy hunters has been similar or equal and greater than the number shot by poachers and of course when you then start adding trophy hunting to all of those other threats then of course it's adding an unnecessary um additional pressure um and and, and i'll give you another example actually so leopards they are classed as an appendix one species in society so it, under 
in CITES speak, that is one of the most endangered species in the world, as far as it's concerned. And there's very, very strict regulations and restrictions on the trade in uh, leopard parts, leopard bodies and body parts. However, it's one of the most popular animals shot by trophy hunters, including by British trophy hunters. It's actually one of the top five African animals. In fact, top five animals uh, that are shot by British trophy hunters, or those that are CITES listed, that, that is. And, and so... And essentially, all you need is to get this permit. And it's a matter of routine rather than rigorous review and inspection. So uh, now the reason for this loophole is quite extraordinary. It says that a hunting trophy isn't trade. It's a personal and household item. Because in a sense, it is that you you know you 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 put that trophy on the wall. It's to you know decorate your living room wall or, or above the mantelpiece or to you know you make a there's a British hunter for example who recently shot an elephant and he's turning its feet into umbrella stands. So he's not selling that on the market. So it's not a commercial transaction in that sense. But of course, the trophy hunting industry is an industry. You know, it, people spend a lot of money going on trophy hunting holidays. You know, if you want to go and shoot lions and rhinos and elephants in the wild, you could be paying £100,000 or more for the privilege of doing that. And there's companies that make have revenues in excess of, a, you know, you know seven-figure sums every year. So clearly, it is an industry. It is a trade. So why this loophole still exists is absolutely beyond me. And I think absolutely it should be challenged. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's Mara. You know, Eduardo, you mentioned you mentioned external pressures on these animals. So I wanted to ask you about a potentially external pressure. And I'm referencing actually America's wealthy and politically powerful gun lobby. And have you noticed that um, any influence from that gun lobby on your campaign in Great Britain? <laughs> well, uh, absolutely, because um, there there isn't a powerful trophy hunting lobby in the uk and so the american gun lobby and the american trophy hunting industry has been weighing in on this issue so safari club international that's the big trophy hunting organization they have an annual lobbying budget of somewhere in the region of 11 million pounds so that's about 14 million dollars something something along those lines and um now, it, it, it does uh, fundraising for its political campaign. So, for example, last year at its convention, uh, it was auctioning off polar bears and leopards and other animals to raise money uh, to support its advocacy campaigns in the UK and elsewhere. Uh, but it specifically put money into campaigns targeting British members of parliament, British ministers, British public opinion. Safari Club International has just hired a top-level lobbyist on a six-figure salary to coordinate their counteroffensive against this bill, and indeed moves by other countries such as Belgium and Finland that have just announced they're going to ban trophy imports as well. Um, so, look, I mean, the industry realises that this could be the beginning of the end. So they are throwing everything um, at this campaign to try to stop the British ban in particular because they see that as the, if you like, the, the, the domino moment, the first domino, because Britain was a country that invented this, exported it to its colonies, and still has that strong relationship with countries like South Africa for reasons of language and culture and history and colonialism, etc. And of course, that transatlantic relationship, and even though we've left the EU, we're still in Europe physically. So, you know, if Britain goes, in their eyes, this is the beginning of the end for them. Well, I, I kind of hope that's true, actually. But that's why they are... Uh, throwing everything in the kitchen sink at this British ban. That's really interesting. I'd like to bring in David at this point because I've um, been doing some reading, I've read some of the mainstream media articles that have also repeated this concern about neocolonialism and some very respectable voices who have raised this as an issue and said, well, why should we be asking African nations to do something that we in Europe won't do, protecting large carnivorous animals, asking people to live alongside large animals? And this is really a form of Western imperialism, essentially. It'd be really good to hear your perspective on this, David, from a South African viewpoint. Thanks very much. And thank you. It's good to be here. Um, it seems to me that... Um, we, we obviously need to be very careful in light of the history of imposing particular values on 
African culture and African tradition. Um, and we need to also allow African traditions and, and philosophies, et cetera, to, to be able to speak. And we're at, actually at the very beginning of that engagement in many ways. Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges I pose to our Minister of Environmental Affairs in South Africa is actually not to just have adopted all the approaches that had been existing in the past and come necessarily from other parts of the world, but actually try and address and bring a traditional African approach towards these kind of questions. And so the question that is raised is, what is such a such an approach? And if we go back a little bit historically, um, what you would find, and I, I here agree with Eduardo, um, communities didn't, this notion of going out and killing animals for entertainment wasn't something that is 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 deeply rooted in African culture. Um, it was, of course, dangerous to do that. And there were animals that were hunted, but animals were hunted for food. Uh, the, if the animal was dangerous, for example, to the community, and there were there were particular reasons why animals were hunted, but people did not go out on hunting parties uh, to to generally just go out and hunt animals for fun. And um, and as Eduardo has said, the essentially that idea, that idea, which was really an idea of domination, was an idea which came in with colonial powers. And by the way, it's interesting to note, it was not only animals that were hunted. Actually, colonialists hunted people too. And the, um, the, the animals of colonial history uh, of initial people coming to places like South Africa were actually shooting people like the San and the Khoi peoples as well. So it was very much about constructing uh, uh, others as less than human, as just there for our purposes, as instruments for our pleasure in many ways. And um, and so that that was the actual origins of this. And actually, you know, as as Eduardo has said, the idea and the attempt to construct trophy hunting as a indigenous uh, uh, approach towards animals is itself colonialist in the way in which it 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 it, it, it is phrased and in the way in which it 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 operates. At the same time, we need to think a little bit more, and I think we have a lot of resources to gain from thinking about African approaches towards animals, because African philosophy is very much about the notion of interconnection, of humans living in uh, in relation to the environment. And this notion of humans as super dominant over the environment isn't something that, that as I said, that's coming very much from often a, a religious um, traditions, but they, it's not coming necessarily from a traditional African philosophy, which is very much about harmonious coexistence with the environment, um, a notion of what's called Ubuntu, that there's a, a kind of relationship that we have with the environment. And so when actually in South Africa recently, the minister, to her credit, engaged in a process to discuss how would we approach environmental policy um, in the new South Africa and actually took on a little bit of this challenge, she appointed a group of experts. And um, initially it seemed like those group of experts were gonna just adopt this line that, um, you know, that domination over animals for human benefit would be uh, the way to go. But what slowly became evident was that actually traditional African communities were not in favor of this kind of ethic and approach. And that actually that, that hunting was not necessarily consonant with traditional African views. And I actually was looking up in preparation for this. There's actually an article which some people might be interested by in Corno in the Journal of Sustainable Tourism, where he actually analyzed social media views, which have recently been done about, uh, 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 about trophy hunting and found that um, generally African people on social media saw very much uh, the discussion of trophy hunting as reproducing colonial uh, relationships as seeing Westerners as coming to kind of shoot and take control of African animals, and also as seeing it as playing into the kind of greed of, of local politicians in many ways. So there were quite, there's some very interesting findings in relation to actually what African people today are thinking about these questions. Of course, there's a diversity of views. I don't want to present this like one particular view on this, on this question, but nevertheless, um, I think th there's some interesting studies to suggest that actually when we listen to African peoples, 
a different relationship is wanted with animals than is being promoted at the moment by those like Safari International. No, that's really helpful to know, actually, um, to have that perspective is invaluable. Tamara. Um, but David, you mentioned Ubuntu and um, traditional and indigenous attitudes towards animals. But, you know, I wanted to probe a little bit here because after Cecil's murder, U.S. Congressman Raul Grijalva sponsored a bill called Cecil's Bill to curb Americans uh, importing of endangered species. but. While um, at the House hearing, Republicans brought forth Dr. Gondiwa of Zimbabwe, who urged that trophy hunting remain in the toolbox of options at Zimbabwe's disposal because allegedly it generates much needed revenue. So what do you say to Africa's governmental representatives like Gondiwa, who insist that they should have exclusive say over how native species are exploited? Well, I think there's an, a, a range of issues over here. The first is, uh, if you look at uh, Zimbabwe's government, it's not clearly uh, a, a highly legitimate government. Uh, there's clearly incredible resistance in, in Zimbabwe. And so there's really a question of the legitimacy of many African governments to actually, um, uh, to actually take decisions about their animals and to actually impose, in a way, their perspectives over their animals. So I would say... Absolutely not. If uh, Zimbabwe transitions into a uh, full, a free and fair democracy, then yes, the people in that in Zimbabwe will have the right to make decisions. But it's not clear at the moment that is the case. What about places like South Africa, where there clearly is a democracy which is free and fair, uh, where people can in fact make uh, decisions in uh, you know in relation to the animals that exist in in the environment? And here. The argument must be to try and actually say, well, we need to actually listen firstly to what I was saying, to the voices of people in, in, in the society to ensure that um, that that what the approach that is adopt, adopted is not just uh, parroting those that come from elsewhere and also is not just, and this is a very important point, um, is not just uh, self-interested in, in the way that actually undermines the very heritage of the community itself. And, um, you know, and I think that was what you heard is a very um, instrumental argument that animals only matter insofar as they generate revenue, right? And this is this is what the what is presented to us. And as I say, I think that is a way of thinking that is actually, you know, it's become quite dominant in the world that what matters is actually generating income. And of course, places like South Africa really need foreign income. But the question is, what ways do you adopt to actually, uh, you know, bring foreign income into the country? We would recognize that there would be certain practices, of course, relating to human beings, which would be highly unacceptable. And similarly, at, uh, practices which involve people simply shooting animals for fun, reducing animals for pure instruments, must be among those that are simply unacceptable as a means of generating revenue. And, um, uh, and also, I would argue, they're unacceptable because they undermine the government's very conservation goals. Because the moment in which you argue that animals only matter for instrumental purposes, you start undermining the very case for caring about those animals. Because the moment that money disappears, Right. For whatever reason, in Zimbabwe is a good case. Right. When Zimbabwe adopted the very controversial land reform measures, etc., um, a lot of foreign tourism stopped. And although they had initially seen real growth in in numbers, for example, of elephants, uh, people stopped being that interested in protecting the animals because, you know, they were told all the time that the only reason to protect the animals is to gain um is to gain revenue from the animals. So I think I think it's a one's on a very dangerous uh, uh, slippery slope, and one can also land up with very dangerous issues relating to again um, the survival of species. We started off. Uh, Eduardo mentioned rhino poaching, and um, you know there's some interesting studies just from the government's own statistics of how there were legal permits given for this, 
Uh, and if you look at 2007, there were only about, I don't know, eight or nine animals that were poached. And within a decade, there were over a thousand, around 1,200 animals that were poached. And so once you promote an ethic, again, that let's say we can exploit animals legally, well, I think there's a real question that comes up, particularly for poorer communities. Well, why is it only those who are wealthy who can get benefits from these animals? These animals only matter for money. So we may as well benefit as well. And so you promote an ethic which ultimately undermines the reasons for protection of animals and ultimately leads to their uh, destruction. I'd like Thank to you, revisit. Evan. Oh, sorry, Tamara. I'd like to revisit this issue of conservation and the, the potential threat to species from a ban. But before I do, if I could just ask you, Eduardo, what um, engagement has there been in Britain uh, with leaders in African nations who might potentially be affected by a ban, um, either in relation to conservation or uh, economic disbenefit? I know that the uh, British government uh, has consulted extensively uh, with African governments and, and African governmental organisations. Uh, so, for example, uh, I think there was 44,000 uh, organisations, entities and individuals that were consulted with, including uh, African leaders and, and individuals as part of the government's public consultation on this process. And it's interesting to note that over 85% of those who were consulted agreed uh, with the proposals that have uh, now come forward as, as legislation. Uh, so, yes, and, and, and indeed British uh, embassies and consular uh, offices were, were engaging directly in Southern African nations um, with their counterparts. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there has been. But it's also important to know, of course, that, uh, uh, you know, African people in general are supportive of an end to trophy hunting. I mean, there was actually this opinion poll very recently co conducted by Ipsos, um, in South Africa, which showed that well, nearly 70% of people support an end to trophy hunting. 70% of people, nearly 70% of people in South Africa support an end to trophy hunting. And I suspect that if you did similar polls in Zimbabwe, Zambia, Namibia, etc., you would find, uh, you know, quite similar uh, results. Um, it, it's, I was actually just uh, a few days ago, I spent um, the, the day with a chap called Boniface Mpario, he is a senior Maasai elder, and uh, he was telling me about, uh, well, he was telling me a lot about uh, African culture and values uh, in relation to nature and wildlife, uh, but also in relation to hunting and uh, the, the complete, um, you know, failure to understand what trophy hunting is about. They just can't understand it. But he was also telling me, of course, about the human cost. And specifically, we know right now, and this has been going on for a long, long time, that the Maasai in Tanzania, where trophy hunting is still permitted, are being brutally evicted um, and oppressed because they wanted to get rid of people off their land in order to make way for trophy hunters, in order to make way for private hunting estates and so on. And of course, if you look across the border, that the experience of the Maasai in Kenya, where trophy hunting is banned, those people have benefited enormously. And in fact, Bonnie, amongst all, uh, indeed, Maasai school children, uh, high school children, are able to access high school education directly as a result of non-consultative wildlife uh, tourism. In other words, photo safaris, nature tourism, uh, and, and so on. And much more money is generated through that for conservation than through uh, trophy hunting. And in fact, if you again compare Kenya and Tanzania side by side, something like 70 times as much money goes into communities and into conservation as a result of photo tourism than trophy hunting. And of course, you know, once you kill an animal, there's no more money to be made out of it, is there? Um, and there was a very interesting study going back to South Africa for a minute about uh, what might be the socioeconomic benefits of switching in an organized fashion from trophy hunting to uh, nature tourism. And it was found that 11 times as many jobs could be created for people in poor rural areas in South Africa if that switch was made. And I know that one of the questions that another opinion poll um, asked is, you know, what do people think about that? And again, there was very strong support uh, amongst people in South Africa for a switch to nature tourism, photo safaris instead of trophy hunting. So it's, it's very clear that actually when you start asking people in Africa, what their views are on this issue, that 
firstly, they just don't get trophy hunting. And indeed, you know, trophy hunting industry groups have actually produced uh, pamphlets and leaflets and organized, you know, workshops to try to explain what trophy hunting is to people because they just don't get it. So firstly, they don't know about it. They don't understand it. They're completely baffled by it. But deep down, they feel very, very, very uneasy about it because it runs completely contrary uh, to their understanding of what our relationship with nature. Now, there are people who will benefit directly, but they're the, going to be the people at the very top. When we're talking about village leaders, village headmen, local councillors, local MPs, and we've been speaking to a lot of them, by the way, a lot of them, all of them, every single one that we've spoken to saying we get nothing. We get nothing from this. There's nothing to repair schools or health clinics. There's nothing to feed people. Um, and we're certainly not seeing any benefits in terms of conservation. Our wildlife is being killed. It's being wiped out. And that actually goes against our interest because then there's nothing for the photo safaris, which do bring us jobs and money and revenues and benefits to the community. That, that's really interesting because I know that Tamara and I both wanted to ask you both about this argument that has been expressed quite forcefully that an unintended consequence of banning the import of trophy hunts is that there will be an, a disbenefit, an economic disbenefit that will actually potentially lead to species becoming extinct or threat the population threatened because we you know we haven't thought this through and in fact it's going to have a detrimental impact on those animals and for people who are genuinely very concerned about animals and like to think of these animals in their environment that may be a very real worry but it sounds from what you're saying Eduardo that you feel that alternative forms of interaction with those animals that are not harmful can also have a positive effect. Well, absolutely. And, and and let's get back to actually what this particular issue right now is about. And that is about the import ban by Britain on trophies coming into the country. Well, let's look at the precedents because we're not the first to do this or to look to do this. This has already been done by the Netherlands. They've got a pretty comprehensive ban. It's been done by the French, the Australians. The Americans have uh, it, you know, implemented various types of ban at different times. What has been the negative conservation consequences of any of those import bans? The answer is nil, zero, zilch. And, and I have actually put it to those people who advocate the case for trophy hunting and say, oh, there's going to be all these unintended consequences. Well, name one, name one example or one paper or anything that shows that the Dutch ban, the American bans, the, the French or the Australian bans have had any noticeable consequences whatsoever. And of course, what you get back is a resounding silence. And let me put it this way. If trophy hunting really was such uh, a panacea for tackling the conservation problems faced by so many species, well, let's go a step further. Let's bring back or introduce trophy hunting for tigers, for orangutans, for gorillas. Why not? We already trophy hunt lots of other primates and lots of other big cats. Well, let's bring it back for those species. And of course, the reality is there is no sane conservation voice or individual or group in the world that would ever, ever say, yeah, the way to bring back gorillas, to bring back tigers is to let trophy hunters loose upon them. Of course, that's not the case. Just let's look at what's happening in terms of the species the British hunters most like to shoot. The top five are elephants, hippos, leopards, zebras, specifically Hartman zebras and lions. Those are the five African species that British trophy hunters like to shoot most amongst like sighties listed. Out. But what's happening to all of those? Well, African elephants that are now two species, forest and, and savannah elephants. Forest elephants are now critically endangered. Savannah elephants are in danger. They've just been upgraded on the IUCN red list. Hippos, well, their population has fallen by up to 20% over the last decade. Leopards, well, numbers here are a bit uncertain. They're difficult to count, but IUCN says the numbers are falling. And you've got estimates by people, credible people in the field are saying they've seen a 90% decline over the last 50 years. Hartman zebras, well, they're vulnerable to extinction. There's only 33,000 of them left. And the lions, well, this is the, the species about which there have been the most number of studies. And we know that lion populations have been severely and directly impacted by trophy hunting, and that in many areas that has been the leading cause of their decline. 
the leading cause of lion decline, greater than any other cause, whether it's snaring or poaching or other forms of persecution or whatever it is, habitat encroachment even, it's been the leading cause. And indeed, that is why trophy uh, ba bans have been implemented, in, for example, in Zambia and in Zimbabwe, because of the effect, the negative effect that trophy hunting was having on those species. Surely if trophy hunting was good for conservation, the only reason to stop it would be, be too successful. There were too many lions. That's not the case. That's not what happened. And indeed, there were before and after studies in Zambia, then lion populations bounced back. They bounced back strongly, fast. So we know, we absolutely know for certain that trophy hunting is not going to help species that's already faced so many pressures this is one pressure we can take off them because trophy hunting is absolutely unnecessary and in the views of the vast majority of people is simply unconscionable in a civilized society yes species face so many different threats and it's very complex but we're not shooting lions because we need to eat them or because we need their skins in order to keep the, ourselves warm or because we need their bones to provide us with fuel we're doing it for fun and to brag about surely that is something that in the bigger picture of things we can all agree let's put an end to that and let's give lions a chance and actually really put the money that's needed into lion conservation into hippo conservation into wildlife species and spaces conservation let's really think about what the priorities were rather than chasing these ridiculous rabbit holes which are, you know clearly are not supported by the evidence Thank you. And David, did you want to come in there? Yes, I think I'm interested a little bit in the in the ethical question. And I think uh, Eduardo kind of touched on this, but just to understand the complexity of saying we're going to protect lions as a species by allowing the shooting for no reason of individual lions. And it, it's a very strange construct that somehow we can care about the wider species, which is ultimately an abstract notion, the species, right? It's a human construction by, in some senses, ignoring the interests of individuals and running roughshod over individuals. And it seems to me that that is one of the basic flaws underlying these arguments that somehow, uh, you know, we can kind of protect the wider good by just ignoring the individual. Ultimately, by ignoring the individual, we school ourselves to lose interest, to not be interested in the wider goal. And we actually, unfortunately, develop forms of character which harden ourselves to those creatures themselves. Uh, a second point I just wanted to add is actually some interesting uh, recent case from South Africa um, which 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 challenged the the minister set has to in terms of South African law set quotas for uh, the number of endangered species that can in fact be hunted. So there was she set a quota on the leopard on black rhino, believe it or not, which is unbelievably endangered, and uh, and um, elephant, right? Um, I think there were 10 for leopards, 10 for black rhinos and 20 and 150 elephants that were allowed to be shot legally. And this was challenged by the Humane Society in court. And a large amount of this was uh, a lot to do with procedure. But ultimately, the important thing is, it, it, and we're waiting the, the, the um, next phase in the case, can the minister actually justify allowing animals which are severely endangered to be shot legally for trophy hunting and in good faith say that that will not cause any harm to the species. And I think what we need to see increasingly is courts. Of course, here we're dealing with a public opinion and a legislative campaign, but we also need to see other bodies like courts holding a government to account and saying to you, can you in good faith justify releasing legal permits to to hunt animals that are in severe threat of extinction? And I think the answer to that can resoundingly be, and clearly, no, you cannot in good faith do such a thing. And I hope that we will see the courts find that. The good news is that they created an interim interdict at the moment. So at the moment, there's no quota until the case actually finalizes for those animals. And we'll see what happens going forward in that regard. 
Uh, if I could just add to, I mean, it, it is absolutely astonishing, isn't it, David? But uh, I mean, we literally, and when I say we, we actually mean the conservation organisation as well as government, don't know how many leopards there are out there. And so you have this ridiculous situation where quotas are being set in the complete absence of any data about the population of species. And it's just not just lepers that this happens with. It happens with you know, lions in Namibia. I mean, it's everywhere. We just don't know. And yet they're still setting these quotas, which are supposedly sustainable. How do you know if it's sustainable if you don't know how many animals are there in the first place? And the idea that it is somehow permissible and acceptable or, or beneficial to shoot black rhinos, a species of which there are 3,142 animals left on the planet, <laughs> you can actually shoot these animals for fun. It, it, it's just mind-blowing in my... But but we, we've got to remember that the quota for shooting black rhinos was doubled at the Geneva Cop of CITES because of pressure and lobbying by the hunting industry. And the trophy hunting industry have an organised presence within CITES. They even have an organised presence within IUCN, the global conservation body. So we have to understand the politics, you know, the dynamics of the decision making. Um, and uh, as David said there, it, there are extraordinary decisions being made, usually on the basis of no real scientific evidence. Thank you very much. Tamara, I'll hand over to you for our final question. Thank you, Paula. Eduardo, let's talk strategy. Saturday, February 25th is the worldwide rally against trophy hunting. And I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, are public protests helpful? Is celebrity involvement helpful? What strategies have worked best for you? Well, I, I, I think that public protests, engaging celebrities, et cetera, all of that should be part of a mix, particularly when you're talking about an issue where there is relatively little awareness. And in, in Britain, I think it's fair to say that most people, if you ask them still today, even despite our campaigns, if you ask them about trophy hunting, they say, oh, that's what Americans do, don't they? They don't know that there are also British lion hunters. There are British elephant hunters. There are British cheetah hunters, polar bear hunters. In fact, that there are, is such a thing as polar bear trophy hunting, which there is. And, uh, and, and yeah, cheetahs as well. We see cheetahs on TV. We love them. There's 6,500 cheetahs. British trophy hunters have been shooting them. So, you know, you have to find ways in which to get this information across to people. Public protest is absolutely legitimate part of that, provided it's, you know, peaceful and so on. Um, at, at engaging celebrities. Well, look, I mean, this is what the um, the hunting industry certainly do it. Uh, the gun lobby do it in order to push their case. You know, Charlton Heston being wheeled out by the NRA. Uh, you know, you've got, what's his name, Tucker from Fox News being wheeled out by Safari Club. It's Donald Trump Jr. being used by Safari Club International. Um, it, they even uh, tried to get uh, the Beach Boys, actually, because they got the Beach Boys to come, or the Rump Beach Boys, uh, uh, Mike Love's Beach Boys, to come and perform uh, a gig at the Safari Club International uh, Convention the year before last. Now, this backfired in spectacular fashion because we actually launched a, a petition about it. Uh, and we got it uh, contacted directly by the original founders of the Beach Boys and say, well, we're completely against what Safari Club International are doing. We're with you. So you have to, I think, find ways in which, um, in legitimate ways, because for better or for worse, we know that uh, you know politicians are more likely, perhaps, to hear that message. The press will be more receptive to it, uh, and so I think you know, yes, in, in, using protests, using celebrities, etc., to engage people, to get information across to them by, and also, of course, bringing it to the attention of decision makers. I, I think that that's all uh, uh, perfectly legitimate, provided you know it's legal and and and, and uh, non-violent, etc. What I I would say is you need to take a multidisciplinary approach. And certainly our strategy has been a pretty wide ranging one. You know, it's been about doing our, our own research, developing content for the media and for policymakers rather than just say, oh, this is really bad. You know, you've got to give them a reason. You've got to give them evidence, hard evidence. You've got to find the people who can speak authoritatively about the issue. Um, and, uh, uh, and yes, uh, engage the, with the media directly, get them involved and interested in it. Uh, and talk to politicians, you know, at the end of the day, and I keep saying this until the cows go home, members of parliament or members of Congress 
They are our representatives. We pay them. We hire them in the same way that we might hire a plumber or an electrician because we've got jobs to do. We've got our children to raise and we're maybe not expert in the ways of electrics and plumbing. So we get an expert in to fix those problems for and we pay for them to do the job. Ditto politicians. We get them to make the laws to make our country or our world a better place, at least in theory, and we pay them to do it out of our taxes. And every four or five years, we have the job review, if you like, um, and we decide whether or not to extend their contract or we fire them. And we need to, you know, we need to see politicians like that. They are there representing us. They're not lording over us. They're there to do our bidding. So politicians, they know to watch the post bag. They watch their inbox. So if they start getting lots of letters, lots of emails about trophy hunting or whatever issue it is, if they get people coming to their constituency surgeries, if they get people phoning them up, then they know they've got to take that issue seriously. And I know for a fact, because a number of MPs have said this to me, look, we get a lot of people contacting us. That's why I'm here at this event. That's why I'm sitting on this committee. That's why I'm doing this photo op. So absolutely use whatever ways to bring this issue to people's attention but look, look at the all the different ways you can do that don't just sort of think well a petition will do it or a, a a march will do it or one story in the press will do it or you know one email to a member of parliament will do it remember there are lots of people competing for their attention and for their time and to go and represent their interests in parliament etc so it is really important to think of all the different ways and to keep at it not take your foot off the gas pedal right you've got to keep at it you've got to be persistent you've got to be like a dog with a bone until it's done i do think it is very important because this campaign is it's an unusual campaign and it's not about actually generally an activity taking place within um uh britain it's a campaign about something taking place elsewhere. And I think there does need to be, as a result, uh, a, a deeper engagement between uh, the work of uh, NGOs and organizations working in South Africa and other parts of Africa and the work of uh, organizations working here. I'm sure Eduardo has connections, but I do think that I think one of the missing components in some ways and 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 I think it's quite dangerous from the uh, perspective of caring about animals is that actually it's it's very important that that people in countries like uh, South Africa uh, are engaged about these kind of questions are actually not just an or one opinion poll but actually that there's a discussion there's a kind of connection that there's actually funding for education about animals and engagement about animals that there's funding for experiences of pe people with animals many people just never get to uh, from poorer communities, actually experience animals in 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 the wild. That's seen as a luxury in many ways, and and those kind of and and those kinds of activities of education engagement are really really critical in building a kind of future which will be respectful of animals across our various continents. So it seems to me that is a a dimension that we need to just put on the table in many ways. Uh, to kind of, in a way, advance both the interests of humans and of other creatures. Thank you, Noel. I, I think that um, sentiment is relevant across all nations. I think we can all do a lot better when it comes to education around attitudes and ethics towards animals. So thank you for raising that. Thank you both for your time. Tomorrow, thank you for hosting this with me. It's been so exciting. <laughs> I had so much fun. Thank you so much for, for having me and inviting me. No, David and Eduardo, it was wonderful talking to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening from. And if you give us a good review, it will help others to find us. And don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss a show. For more information about the work of the UK Centre for Animal Law, please go to www.alaw.org.uk. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com.